This is the intriguing story of one of the biggest financial disasters in history. One company called Long-Term Capital Management almost brought the entire financial world to its knees. This is the story of what happened when genius failed. Since the beginning of capitalism, there has been one golden rule. If you want to make money, you have to take risks. Then one day came one of the most astounding projects of the 20th century. The attempt to find a mathematical way to break that rule. To find a magic formula to enable anyone to become unimaginably wealthy without taking any risk at all. In the 1930s, academics decided to test if top day traders could actually predict how prices moved. They decided to run a series of bizarre experiments. In one of them, they simply picked stocks and shares at random. They threw darts at the Wall Street Journal while blindfolded. At the end of the year, this random choice outperformed the predictions of top traders. This was a revelation and meant that prices themselves must be moving totally at random, and therefore it was impossible by definition to predict anything about them. This led the academics to a devastating conclusion. Despite all the claims of the day traders, it now looked like anyone who managed to make a successful prediction in the stock market must be doing it not by skill, but by chance alone. This discovery of randomness caused outrage amongst the traders, but it galvanized the academics for they knew that mathematics had been used successfully to study random, unpredictable phenomena before. Everything from population growth to the weather. So they now began a quest, the equivalent in economics of the race to the moon, to find a scientific and rational way to tame the markets, to use the power of mathematics to conquer risk. In 1900, a young French graduate student called Louis Bachelier wrote a mysterious and unknown book which lay undiscovered in the library of the University of Paris for over half a century. Within this book lay hidden mathematical secrets. Bachelier set out to do what nobody had done before. Using a series of equations, he created the first complete mathematical model of the markets. He too realized that stock prices moved at random and that it was impossible to make exact predictions about them. But then Bachelier said that he had found a solution, a wonderful way to get rid of risk, an obscure, almost magical financial contract called an option. He believed that if someone could discover a formula to use this rare financial instrument effectively, they would be able to tame the markets completely but he died before he could find it. Although unable to complete his work, Bachelier had shown others the way. All it needed was for someone to work out how to price options accurately and they would have the secret to unlimited wealth. Throughout the 50s and 60s, some of the finest academic minds got to work to try and find this holy grail. But after 20 years of struggle, the academics were no nearer to pricing options than they had ever been. It seemed that Bachelier's elusive magic formula would never be discovered, but all this was about to change. In 1968, two mathematical geniuses, Myron Scholes and Fisher Black, set out to tackle a problem of pricing options which had baffled generations of academics. For decades, mathematicians had added more and more complexity to their models, but Black and Scholes stripped away anything that could not be measured. What they were left with was the bare bones of the problem, the elements which everyone agreed you needed to know in order to correctly value an option. The stock price, the volatility, the duration of the contract, the interest rate, and the level of risk. They could measure all these things. They were all quantifiable except one, the level of risk. 
So Black and Scholes decided to think laterally. If they couldn't measure risk exactly, perhaps they could somehow make it less significant. The method they devised was to become one of the most significant discoveries in economics in the 20th century. Their ingenious system was called dynamic hedging. They created a theoretical portfolio of stocks and options and whenever either fluctuated up or down, they tried to cancel the movement out by making another risky move in the opposite direction. Their aim was to keep the overall value of the portfolio in perfect balance. Since everything moved at random, this was extremely difficult, and at first they could only cancel a little of the movement out. But eventually, using complex algorithms, they finally found they could balance out a movement precisely. They soon discovered that dynamic hedging could balance out any movement at all. They could create a perfect equilibrium in which risks cancel themselves out. They had found a theoretical way to not just reduce risk, but to eliminate it altogether. By dynamically hedging, Black and Shoals were able to remove the last immeasurable element and risk itself dropped out of their equations. And without risk, they finally had a mathematical formula to give them the price of any option. If they knew the price of a stock, they would now also know precisely the price of the option. Black and Scholes had solved a problem that had baffled generations of academics. It was a marvellous achievement, but there was a practical problem with their formula. It took time to calculate the dynamic hedging. In the time this took, the fast-moving markets would have moved on and their calculations would effectively be out of date. What was needed was a way to instantly recalculate to keep eliminating the risk continuously. Unbeknownst to Black and Scholes, someone had found a way. By the early 1970s, Professor Robert Merton had developed a reputation for using exotic and abstract mathematical ways to study financial contracts like options. Black and Scholes contacted Merton and asked for help with their formula so that it could work in the real world of fast-moving markets. For this, Merton turned to rocket science. He had studied the theories of a Japanese mathematician, Ito, who had faced a similar problem to Black and Scholes. In order to plot the path of rockets, you needed to know exactly where the rocket was, not just second by second, but literally all the time. Ito had developed a way of dividing time into infinitely small parcels, smoothing it out until it became a continuum, so that the trajectory could be constantly updated Bob Merton used this idea and adapted it for the Black and Scholes formula. Using the notion of continuous time, the value of the option could be constantly recalculated and risk eliminated continually. The magic money-making formula that Black, Scholes and Merton unleashed on the world in 1973 was a fulfilment of a 50-year quest. Here was a formula which could, it seemed, get rid of risk in the financial markets. Academics marvelled at its breathtaking insights and its sheer audacity. Stock traders around the world now programmed the formula into their calculators, and a new age of capitalism had begun. Then at the very height of their reputation, they too decided it was time to make money. So in 1995, Myron Scholes and Robert Merton went into business, and they did it on a vast scale. Together with a team, they created a giant company, a hedge fund called Long-Term Capital Management. LTCM promised to use mathematical modelling and algorithms to make investors unheard of amounts of money. Merton and Scholl's reputation as the greatest academic minds in finance made it easy to raise money. Banks, pension funds and other investors all competed to invest. Within months, they had raised $3 billion and were ready to start investing across the globe. From their headquarters in a small town in Connecticut, they devised one of the most ambitious investing strategies in history. It was to be shrouded in secrecy. Not even their investors were allowed to know what they were doing. 
they would use probability to bet that key prices would move roughly as they had done in the past. But just in case any prediction went wrong, they would use their magic algorithm with its dynamic hedging to protect them by taking out options in the opposite direction. Supremely confident, LTCM placed vast sums of money on the markets, and it worked. LTCM was spectacularly successful, outperforming any other investment company. Merton and Scholes had proved, it seemed, that academics could cut it in the real world, and they basked in their success. In their first year, they returned 21% to their investors, and in the second year, this increased to 43%, and in the third year, another 41%. LTCM thought they had become the masters of the financial universe. Yet slowly, and totally unexpectedly, a change in market dynamics would alter everything. In the summer of 1997, across Thailand, property prices collapsed. This sparked a panic which swept through Asia. Banks went bust from Japan to Indonesia, and then people took to the streets. These things were so improbable that they had never been included in any mathematical model. As prices leapt and plunged like never before, the models traders used began to give them strange results. So they relied instead on their instincts. In a time of crisis, cash is king. Traders stopped borrowing and dropped investments in risky places. But at LTCM, their algorithm told them not to panic and that everything would return to normal soon. After all, if anything was to go wrong, the algorithm simply told them to make another bet in the opposite direction. But as panic spread, the cost of doing this increased dramatically as the price of options soared and things were going wrong, very wrong and very fast. Most other traders were reducing risk in these dangerous times. LTCM was doing the exact opposite of a normal trader. To afford the more expensive options, they began to borrow and do it heavily. LTCM took on debts of $100 billion. The magic formula told them that this is what they must do and that everything would be okay, just as it had been in previous years. But with the whole market in chaos and with so many bets now going wrong, the cost of buying all those options to bet in the opposite direction stretched LTCM to the very limit. They were now well and truly maxed out. But the magic formula which had won its creators the Nobel Prize in 1997 was followed impeccably. Its creators believed it could never fail. LTCM was just about able to afford the cost of this extra borrowing. They would be able to continue to hedge just as long as one more totally improbable thing did not happen. In August 1998, something happened that no one had considered possible. The biggest country in the world suddenly and without explanation refused to pay all its international debts. This was never considered a possibility when the formula was devised, since a sovereign issuer should never need to default as it could simply print more money. But it did happen and now all the calculations in LTCM's model were finally and hopelessly out of kilter. All the patterns and rules which once existed seemed to vanish in an instant. The mathematical model simply couldn't cope with the dramatic changes that were happening in the real world and that nobody could have foreseen. The model had predicted that they shouldn't lose more than $50 million in any given day, but now they were losing $100 million day after day, and there was one day just four days after the default where LTCM lost an incredible $500 million in a single day. With the debt spiralling to astronomical levels and the algorithm completely paralysed and churning out meaningless numbers, LTCM was finally facing bankruptcy. But if the company went down, it would also take with it the total value of the positions it held across the globe, and these were now staggering and amounted to a trillion dollars. 
the equivalent of a year's turnover by the American government was about to be wiped out. The world's financial regulators met in crisis. In order to prevent an economic collapse, the American central bank, the Federal Reserve, had no choice but to organize a bailout of LTCM. The terms were humiliating. Merton and Scholes lost millions, and so did their investors, among them pension funds, the Central Bank of Italy, and Britain's Barclays Bank lost an average of $200 million each. The Black Shoals formula continues to be used millions of times a day, but by traders who know when to trust it and when instead to turn to their own intuition. By people who understand the financial markets, places full of dangers and mysteries which have not yet been reduced to a scientific explanation.